running now in terms of French. And um, so each year we have a, have a theme, and this year is IRL in real life. And so that's really a response to our rapid changes and uh, globalization and digitalization and like to find out how we as designers can respond to this and these challenges and opportunities in real life and how we can help to solve these problems in everyday life. So as a response and part of the Archi French, we have an open program and a core program. So the open program is an open platform where anyone can take part and present. <laughs> so thanks. We um, have their different events on it, but then we also have the core program, which is uh, this event today, and the exhibition has at last as part of this. And this response to the theme we have each year. And this was really come out that we felt we would like to commission people for themes we feel are important to us. And this is actually part of this other and clear space, which you can see behind you. It's part of a continuation of Uncommon Lives, which we started last year, which was, is about the people or groups which we feel have maybe overlooked in our society and giving them a voice. So it's really nice to see that we could, could continue these themes uh, in a follow-up year this year. And uh, we have also, I'm not sure if you know, we have these monthly meetups before the start, uh, over starting, I think, in autumn last year, where we have monthly meetups and anyone come along to find out what we are doing. And Janice, who actually came up uh, to one of these events and presented herself, and we were like, yes, this is exactly who we're looking for. And it was really nice that through coming along to our events or open meetups that we found this connection. So that's just how I wanted to introduce um, how this came a bit but about this uh, Home at Last project and event today. And so I would like to hand over to Raising the Roof, which is Janice Parker, Adil Patrick and Sue John, who are with um, Home at Last asking how to create radical new homes for ourselves as we move into living our older lives. Thank you. Thank you. Sue John, um, in case you didn't spot which one's which, I hope that you have, uh, but I'm Sue. Um, first of all, I'm just going to run down what's going to be happening over the next two hours, because uh, we've got two hours together, which is uh, a really nice thought. Um, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Adele and to Janice, and they're going to tell you a bit about how we got here and our origin story. Then we're going to talk about almost where we're coming from, really, a brief um, individual histories of our housing and professional lives to put in more context, um, again, how we got here. And then a bit about what do we want, our, our shared vision. And then that should take us really through the, the first hour. And then the second hour, we hope, will be more of a, an interactive uh, but solution-focused discussion that gets us closer to our goal. So that's more or less how we'll roll uh, this afternoon. But we'll be passing the microphones kind of two and four, so we're a bit of a performance piece as well, so we will be moving around, so hopefully you'll be able to keep track of us as we do that, and we won't tie ourselves in knots with our microphones. So I'm going to hand over to Janice and to Adele, who are going to tell us a bit about our origin story of, uh, of Raising the Roof. We will definitely get our microphones in a fan. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to see so many people here. Um, I'm Janice Parker. Um, I always have to read things because I can never remember. And um, we thought it would be good just to let you know our, our origin story, how we got together, because really there's a lot of serendipity in it. Um, it definitely didn't happen by design, um, and it happened including being right here now. Um, I go a lot to Cove Park, which is an artist retreat in Argyll. I think of it as running away from home, and I think of it as an introvert's paradise, because you can go to 
co-part, work as an artist, and never be disturbed, never see anybody, never talk to anybody, <coughs> if you don't want to. There's plenty of people to talk to if you do. Um, I was there one summer, two years ago, and Cove Park have uh, dinners where they invite some of the outside world in to meet with the artists. Um, so Adele and I were both invited to dinner, and as part of that dinner you change seats, you change places, and you've got all these different people to sit beside. Um, I think maybe because we were out of work context, and we didn't know each other, but didn't know each other very well, um, we found ourselves talking about other things in life that weren't our work. I don't know maybe now how that happened. But I remember really clearly Adele talking and the hairs on the back of my neck started to rise because I could hear my own words and my own thoughts and my own feelings being said by Adele. So I stopped you at one point and I went, we had this conversation before. <laughs> and you went, no, I don't think so. And and then I went, Bleh, because I'm thinking is that the same? And of course it was about how are we going to live our older lives? How do we solve our housing needs? Um, so that very night we shook on it and we said, okay, we're going to have a five year plan. So as I said, that was two years ago and we've had a number of meetings in between that. Would you? Yes, and uh, started tentatively um, connecting other people into the conversation. So I think we had a real milestone last year when we, uh, we knew upstairs some people might have already discovered Voices of Experience, uh, the project there, and we've got some sort of like incredible, eminent women architects in our midst today. But um, we, I think through Women's Library, we connected with Suzanne Ewing, who had some architecture Edinburgh, in Edinburgh, and Jude Barber, who is part of the collective, um, who we'd connected with as she was involved in uh, bringing about women's library design, and Nicola McLaughlin as well. And we, we sort of took, took our courage in our hands and thought, let's talk to them too, because they're women that we know know more than we do about the architecture side of it. I think that was a catalytic type of moment, wasn't it? Yeah, and then we just seriously, literally, because of our hectic lives, as I know everybody in this room has, um, have only managed to meet two or three very intense, very productive times in that two years. Um, but that particular meeting really gave us heart to continue um, that there was something really here to investigate and explore. Um, and then Marion mentioned earlier the um, open meeting that I went and did a pitch to, and I think it was the very, very first one, and you sent me a little tweet going, maybe this is one for you, Janice, because it was in Edinburgh. I live in Edinburgh. Um, so I got up, it felt early on a Saturday morning, and went, um, on a bus journey and walked into this room and I'm quite, in fact I'm very shy about public speaking so I walked in, everybody was lovely and so I said are you here to pitch something and I went no not really, I'm, I'm just here to, yeah I've got a bit of an idea, very unformed but I'm very much here just to listen and feel it out which is naturally what I do. Um, and then found this glorious mix of people pitching about all sorts of things, talking about this and that and neighbourhoods and things on the sea and things in the land. And before I knew it, I was up there um, giving a very personal account of um, what this meant to me. And um, I got a cheer. There was a cheer went around the room. <laughs> And I also have to say at that point, and I think it was a cheer because I think it's, it's a real issue for a lot of people in society right now. Um, it wasn't that I was great in any way, but there was a real ripple in the room. And what was lovely for me as well, I hadn't done any research whatsoever. 
and I had no idea that there was a topic called in real life. I had, had no idea of the context really I was speaking in. So again, another total serendipitous moment for us. I'm conscious as well that um, Sue's got her own um, sort of things to share, uh, but I did want to sort of say something that like Janice mentioned a little bit about hectic lives, and uh, I think that that is um, an absolute understatement for most of the people that I know who are involved in any type of creative endeavours or activists or involved in um, challenging the structural inequalities that are just sort of uh, evident uh, socially, economically, uh, environmentally. Um, and I suppose that you talked about serendipity and I think that one of the things that has happened the last few while for me is that I got uh, the opportunity to do a club leadership fellowship. And when Jellis had done the pitch and had had the invitation to be involved, uh, asked us are you going to be there? Is it, is it, you know, can we take up this opportunity? And it fell in a period where I've been doing this sort of cloth thing. And uh, I, th I seriously think that um, we postpone uh, getting involved in projects like this because we know that um, notwithstanding all the incredible activities that are happening in Scotland, you still sort of feel like there's a hell of a lot of uh, pioneering stuff and almost like research, 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 questions, 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 uh, that is going to be incredibly uh, labour intensive. So fortunately, Claire has given me an opportunity to say yes to this. Um, and uh, we're going to spend the next week uh, really, really mining uh, this and, and fine tuning it and developing it with your support. Um, but I wondered whether it might be a time so to, because we're talking about this thing, but what are, what are the goals, what is the vision for this thing and why is it going to be a meaningful thing, hopefully for, for us and for wider communities itself? Um, I mean, I, I suppose in trying to think about summing this up into one goal, um, I think between us we've probably got a summary of that that is very, uh, an obvious thing about kind of how a housing solution for the future, but I think for me when I was thinking about the goal of this, it was also to be in a context of being part of a, a solution and not part of the problem in terms of local and global environmental issues, and, and that to me feels really important in terms of housing um you know to i want to be living in a context that is feels light on the earth and low on uh, the draining of resources but also i think I, I want to be part of something that hopefully is uh, pioneering and that we can you know maybe find that we're leading in, in this way because as you said adele you know never is, is the whole issue of, of housing and particularly for us, you know, how we're thinking about housing for, for older lives, uh, you know, never more has this been more critical now to be thinking of, of and, and acting on. So I suppose that the broader goal for me is around around that, that thinking. Um, yeah, so we were talking about this this morning and it, it's kind of in response to hearing each other articulate what our particular goals are. Um, and mine became very simple, which is that my goal is to be able to step into and embrace without fear living my life as an older person. And how do we do that? How do we make that come about? And I think also this idea, uh, this is sort of like an iterative process, so apart from the meetings that we've had, um, some of the conversations that we've had are around texts or ideas or things that are part of almost like the lived experience that we call, call research. Um, that has led us to sort of visioning together the idea of creating a small community, a community of neighbours who live well um, in a space that is uh, aesthetically pleasing and beautiful to us, 
that is fit for purpose and uh, where we can look out for each other and look after each other. And I'm deliberately not using the word care for each other there because of the sort of freighted nature of that term. Obviously, we're going to sort of unpick that a little bit. But where we can look out for each other, and we decided on the look out for each other because it doesn't sound like something that funders say. Um, because it can very quickly collapse into meaningless twaddle um, if you use terms uh, injudiciously or you use them and then they're co-opted and so on. So at the moment, looking out for each other is not part of the lexicon of, uh, of funding. So I suppose one thing that we wanted to do is, uh, because we've noticed over the last wee while people making uh, some spectacular sort of assumptions really about where we're coming from and where we've been. Um, so we thought that we might share a little bit of, of that just to sort of give an idea about our housing histories or our home histories or whatever. But I don't know, Sue, whether do you want to mention something? <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, okay. Um, I suppose I, I have always lived in social housing. I was bought and brought up on a council estate in East Manchester. I've uh, never owned any property. And do you know, I've never been interested in owning any property. I have no uh, desire to be part of the kind of, you know, leaving a house or leaving an estate to anybody. I don't have children and I'm not, I've never been part of that kind of, uh, you know, ascendancy of uh, through, through property ladders and, and so on. That's not what interests me at all. But my first working experience was in public housing, public sector housing in Manchester. I worked with single homes people for a number of years um, uh, before I came to Glasgow 30 years ago. So uh, I've been a housing professional and then really for, uh, then I came up here to study Glasgow School of Art and then uh, some of you might know me as being uh, involved in Glasgow Women's Library for about the past hundred years so I've been there a long time uh, so, uh, so so a lot of you know me from that um, and currently I, I live in housing that uh, is award-winning it's won Saltire Awards and various things it's a housing association uh, place uh, that is it's actually a shared ownership model uh, and uh, I've lived there for 10 years from it being new and I suppose I've been reflecting on um, what a spectacular failure it's been from my point of view, not just in terms of the properties, that this was a, it was part of a master plan so it was all architect designed, the, some of the best architects in Glasgow were involved in, in, this, uh, in this master plan at the Gallagate and uh, you know so award winning but it's been for me um, they put story cheaters in, for example, which are now, 10 years later, defunct, incredibly <laughs> expensive. Uh, once I kind of, you know, give up working with their salary, I'll probably plunge into fuel poverty uh, and so on. And the idea was that with this master plan is that it's built round a uh, square. There's no sense of community there. There's nothing, no investment from Mollendine the Housing Association of even pretending to want to create a community there. So I've been asking myself questions about kind of the role of architects and, and so on in, in building communities and then kind of walking away with the awards uh, and thinking, well, that's up to you to create the community. And well, do you know, it has to be conducive. So we've been asking all these questions about community, but I've lived in brutalist architecture. I've lived in a, a range of flats like many of us have from private rented uh, to council. So. You know, I suppose that that's, I've been homeless twice, I've you know, gone through a, a number of kind of uh, all these ups and downs and peaks and troughs with, with houses and uh, I know that is a shared experience by, by lots of people. Um, but I suppose that the main thing now is uh, all these experiences, uh, personal and professional, will I think are, are kind of trying, you know, funneling through to where we all find our, ourselves at now in asking questions and do you know there's a lot of we don't have the answers to, to a lot of these questions, but we have lots of questions and we know the answers for some of the questions about what we want. We don't know the answers to what else is happening or who can help us, and I suppose that's what part of this panel is about. Um, yeah, so I grew up in council housing. Um, interestingly enough, always on new estates, so I had a little time, the newest was um, I moved into Glenrothes Newtown. 
um, only for eight months, I'm not quite sure why now, my, my little brother started school there, um, and I, but I remember it being a sense of, it was a feeling of utopia, it was to be celebrated, it was a thing to really celebrate. I also remember we felt as a family really lucky to have somewhere that, that was that brand new. Um, so we were excited as a family. Um, and there was actually something really exciting about living somewhere where everybody was new. So I'm, I'm very grateful that I experienced that. So I was never the new girl at school because there was a new girl and boy and person tomorrow. And that, that, so that was, a, that was a, a nice thing to experience. Um, then in my sort of adult life, it's been mainly rented cottages. I've lived a lot in rented farm cottages, um, some of which, which I've loved because they're in the country and they really work for my introverted self. And, but you know, they have damp running around the walls. And I remember one where I, um, and I loved it. I loved living there. And um, it had a coal fire and no other heating. So in the winter, I would get the clothes horse, as we called it, which was an old wooden one. And I'd put tin foil on it, and I'd put it on the other side of the fire. And that's, I either had a hot bath, because the fire heated the bath. That's good. <laughs> uh, so I'd go and have a hot bath, heat myself from top to toe, and um, then curry in to this little area that I'd made myself and slept there as well, because it was really too cold to go to bed. And I also remember as a kid getting. Um, dressed in bed, I'm sure lots of us did, yeah, because it was too cold, you couldn't do your buttons or anything if you got up, so you just did it all in bed, because it was the warmest place. Um, so, yes, and, and I've lived in rented rooms from friends, I've lived 22 floors up when I lived in Canada, which interestingly over there is a status, so high rises, unlike here, where it's not really cool to live in a high rise, there it's really cool and the higher the better. So that was interesting to also experience that. Um, and now I, I live in, in a converted building um, in a beautiful location, um, but in a building that's had no love in the development, none at all for the original memory and energies of that building and, and who inhabited it. And you can feel it in the bones of the building that there's just no love there. And, and also that it, it you know, the, the spec isn't good. It's been done quickly. It's been carved up to get the maximum number of flats out of the size of the building. And you can just feel it in the very soul of, of living there. Um, and even in, and it's very very small. And even in that situation, I worry about heating bills. In fact, I can't believe what they are. I just can't believe it. Um, for what is basically one room and a wee bit added on, um, it's like blows me away. I don't know how people in bigger spaces keep warm. Um, yeah, I moved to Glasgow. Um, I think a wee bit before, so maybe about. 35 years ago, I uh, came to Glasgow and had what a lot of people maybe have experienced as well, this sort of sequence of uh, awful flats. Uh, exciting because tenements were like the height of exoticism for me coming from Doncaster. Um, high ceilings were like signifiers of, uh, you know, aristocracy and, and so on and so forth. So, um, but um, certainly I had my fair share of midnight flips due to uh, drunk landlords coming in and demanding rent that I've already given them, to, uh, yeah, hiding in a post office one time because I was going to go and get my housing benefit in an area where there was another horrid landlord who was sort of uh, stoking us and, and so on. Uh, compulsory eviction from flats where I've been paying rent but the person who owned the flat had not been paying paying their mortgage. And then, yeah, the high-rise adventure. Um, after a wee period of homelessness, um, I got housed in, actually it was, um, it was uh, over-occupancy or whatever they call it, where they shouldn't really put two people in a one-bedroom flat, but they did. Um, 
So uh, I was really grateful to be housed at all at that point. And I was living in Dubar, which um, some of you might know as part of the Anderson Centre. And I was just looking this up recently. It was built in 1972 by Richard Seifert, or Seifert, who is the guy, the architect who designed Centre Point in London. And the experience of living there was really, really uh, hairy. Um, and one, um, uh, apparently, at the white heat of it being an appalling place to be living in, where escalation of drug using and uh, uh, soliciting and so on had reached sort of like um, peak horridness, it was nominated as uh, one of the hundred best buildings in Scotland uh, by. Um, prospects. So uh, for me, that disjuncture between the notion of architectural excellence and the reality of living in a space was really, really brought home to me. And um, one of the things that, uh, moments I remember was that I was, I was actually subsidising my work in Glasgow Women's Library by working in Historical Critical Studies Department in Glasgow School of Art. And I remember one of my colleagues putting a poster up in the department, and it was about the first sort of like really massive romantic thing about brutalism. So, so some of you might have been to the brutalism conference um, in the early 2000s, and this building was going to be the focus, the building I was living in was going to be the focus of uh, academic discussion about the wonders of this particular building. And I remember sort of saying, I, I live there. <laughs> Do, do you want me to tell you? Do, do you want me to come and tell you about it? No, 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 it's, it's okay. It's, it's actually okay, no. So, like, the reality of the, the sort of lack of synergy, between, you know, it just sort of felt like a moment where you're living in a building and the architect, there's a view about the architecture, but actually, A, they're not listening in the first place at that time, but even when you're living there, they, they, they don't want to hear about it. So, very, very quickly, I just wanted to mention a couple more things. So, I'm in a building 20 years in a high-rise in Glasgow, and, and the miseries of that, um, and thinking there must be an alternative. So, this is not the first time we've felt this. So, we got in, heavily involved in a project called Four Walls, that was, some of you will know as an innovative housing project for women, that's still going, so maybe about seven years' involvement in that, and then deciding not to be housed in that after being involved in that project for a long, long time. But then Sue and I got involved in Four Walls. Take Root. Take Root, sorry, Take Root. So Take Root was actually a self build housing project, and I just wanted to mention something here. So it was a Siegel Method self-built timber frame women's housing project. So you can imagine in the early 2000s, you know, <laughs> that's not going anywhere really. But anyway, we did, we did actually give it our all, and I think that was over a decade, uh, trying to devel develop this women's timber frame self-built housing project. And it had so many wonderful aspects to it, and we did loads and loads of work. But some of you will know that in the Women's Library, where that, the archive of this project is, is housed, it, it was closed, it was, it was sabotaged, basically, by a journalist. And all I'll say is that the headline on the, the cover of the sun said, Loony Lazzies Plan Man Free Zone. So that was, the, that was the end of that project after about a dozen years. So, this is a, almost like our last gasp. This is our last, you know, because basically this is an aging project and frankly we're aging. So, um, do you know, while we still have the energy and the gumption and the desire and the evident need to have this discussion and so on, um, we feel like we're ready for the next, the next go. So, Janice, do you want to talk a little bit about lived 
campaigning and professional experience, because you've got some feelings about this and thoughts about this. Thank you. Um, we're all going to take a little turn about uh, coming, sharing our own particular place that we're coming from and our own particular uh, wouldn't call it expertise from my perspective but the resonance is for me where it's coming from um, as a lived experience. Um, I very much feel the impact of now being 61 Sometimes I lie, actually. I find myself lying and saying 62, but it's honestly only 61. And, <laughs> and because I want to celebrate it, I want to, well, I don't know if I want to celebrate it, but I want to find a way of entering into that time in my life with, as I said earlier, without fear. How to enter into it without fear. I probably will be a burden somebody someday but how do I enter into that without fear and plan for that and how can we reverse that thinking so that older people aren't a burden they just are a beautiful natural part of our life and our lifespan and our life experience and um, how do we just how do we embrace that and enter into it so I've become very conscious of trying to um, or wanting to really step into that process and and become that person and try not to run away from that person. Um, and I want to do that early. I want to do that while it is our last gasp, but I've still got the energy to, to, to do that gasping. And I read somewhere, can't remember where at all, that human beings find it impossible to imagine themselves in 10 years time so we make plans now based on what we think will be in 10 years time but actually it's very very inaccurate and so I started to I've always hung out with older people I've always worked with older people in my work as a, um, a dance artist and choreographer who works with people and often works with people who are quite invisible and who have got a voice and who aren't really valued in the dance world as proper dancers. Um, I've also never been a proper dancer, which I'm very proud of. Um, so I, then I started to really notice and observe, and um, you know, I'm very lucky at the moment to be working with w women, they are, um, who actually could be my mother. So I am in an intergenerational project at 61 and these women are in their 80s and 90s and able to we dance together but also they are professional dancers but able to um, observe discuss think about that what does it mean ask their advice um, so I, I really feel I'm in this this book it's a kind of lived research project of, of what does it mean? What might happen? And I, I d definitely came to the conclusion I have to start it now. I can't wait till I don't have the energy. You know, I feel it in my body. It is not just a number. I have things in my attic that 20 years ago I quite happily, oh, 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 and up they go. I can't get them down myself because I literally don't have the physical strength. That's just a fact. It's neither good nor bad. It just is that that has happened. I had a, a, a funny story I told to you today that I carry a rucksack, as we all do, carry our lives in our backs, and I found myself in Blackwell's bookshop. This is actually, I was still in my 50s, and I was down, I was crouching down at the bottom shelf to look for a book, and I tipped over backwards, <laughs> and I was like that on the floor, like an upside down sheet or a turtle, and I couldn't get up again, and I just started to laugh, and I thought, I haven't got the strength to hold up my own rucksack anymore, and um, lighter rucksack is needed, but it was, it was a complete, it's a difference in my physicality now, um, and I want to acknowledge, and I want to embrace, and I want to be with, and um, I also work in care homes, I find 
Very interesting. I know some people who are very, very happy in care homes. I, I worked with a woman in Shetland who had looked after her parents all her life on the croft. And once they passed on, the first thing she did was get herself into the care home. And Mary was so happy. So there are lots of happy stories. Um, I have always felt that it's not for me. Personally, not for me, and that's for a number of reasons. One is uh, the one model. We've got stuck, I feel we've got stuck in a business model of care. Um, and that it's like a big machine that we're all trying to fix and make it as good as it possibly can be. I just want to jump off. Um, I find it capitalist. I find it really, I really struggle that um, the care staff are on minimum wage. I struggle that they make profit or at least have to make even. I, I, I struggle with that whole way of thinking. Not only has it come from a medical model, but it now is firmly stuck in this business model and I just see it being perpetuated over and over again. I can't believe the cost. I'm like, ah, I just can't believe it. Um, and it just feels fundamentally that there's something not right about that, or at least we need a choice and, and, and diversity. Um, I've started to think about new economic models. So I'm really at the beginning of this, but I've been looking at degrowth, um, I've been looking at the donut economy, I've been trying to read, I'm beginning to read up on all that, but what does that mean? And what is a greater good model? And I don't even really know what I mean by that yet. But what is a greater good model? Whereas I'm unhappy any bit of money that I have goes into my care. I'm totally happy that happens. But I want to have agency and autonomy within that. And I want to find a way that um, what I contribute cannot be sold on, but can be gifted in some way to a more sustainable, greater good model that's based on trust. I mean, one of my questions is, um, how formal do we actually have to be? Do we need to be a um, housing co-op? How formal do we need to be? Can we just do it on trust? Um, could we be a kick, a community interest company? I don't know, but I, I'm starting to think of these alternative ways. Could we be a social enterprise model, but for ourselves? Again, I don't know but starting to think that way. Um, and also just thinking of, of the environment right now. Isn't this the moment to be as sustainable as we can? Can we be totally off grid and not part of any powerful, um, it not paying into a big system, but have our own wee windmill and then the extra electricity we have, can we give it to the local school and the local hospital and the street lights? And, is that possible? And um, how can we build an environment, how can we build somewhere that might last for another hundred beautiful years and goodness knows how many generations might be able to live in that after me? Um, I think I've said enough. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think, um, I don't think I'd thought about care homes <laughs> before um, my mum went into one. My mum's 91 and she lives in a care home now. It, extremely happy. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, and before we kind of got together a couple of, I suppose a couple of years ago um, and started to frame these thoughts and conversations, I found myself, I, I live in the East End and I work in the East End and in my walk into work, I pass a care home every day. And I found myself thinking, that's where I'll end up because it's local and, and almost like kind of a projection there that that was my destiny because I don't have wealth, I don't have property, I don't have uh, capital and, and so on and so on. Uh, and that was quite a shake up thinking, why am I thinking like that? Well, I suppose I was thinking like that because there aren't many other models and that's why we're here trying to talk about creating another model. And, you know, I mean, for us, I mean, I see as us, you know, we're the clubbing generation. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're kind of like the first generation 
uh, after our parents, where the music of today is still the music that, that we were grooving to in the 70s and 80s, quite frankly. All those bands are still touring and, you know, <laughs> your, our kids are listening to them and so on. So, you know, we, we want to be dancing in our houses. We want to be, you know, I'm a vegetarian, I've been, a, I'm a lesbian, I've, been, I'm a, I've got in a part, I'm in partnership for over 25 years with my partner. And, um, uh, I, I was a lesbian avenger, uh, you know, I, I, how do all these things get incorporated into who I am and how I want to live with other people uh, uh, around me uh, and uh, outside of that care home model because this, there ain't no way that's going to be accommodated in the current care home model um, uh, of, of today. So, you know, I've been kind of having these thoughts uh, a lot um, before and, and since uh, we got together. Um, and I suppose that there's also, I've been thinking as well, that there's an assumption made that arts and cultural leaders or professionals, um, like, you know, I mean, Jan is a phenomenal professional choreographer, dancer, you know, a leader in her field, uh, an outstanding woman of Scotland from the Saltire Award last year, uh, you know, Adele, uh, Scotswoman of the Year a couple of years ago, a Lifetime Achievement Award from uh, this, this city last year. Y you know, we are seen as kind of, people kind of know who we are, and I think there's an assumption that we'll be retiring into uh, comfort and big pensions and do you know we, we the way that we've built the women's library means that there ain't any big pensions there's barely a pension you know because we we weren't paid we weren't paid for the first decade we in fact we were subsidizing it ourselves from our initially from our uh, benefit money and then uh, gradually from from kind of low pay so you know all these things are, again are, are, are i suppose contextual to to, to where we are but uh, i'm going to hand over to you adele for a final thing i know we're getting to the end of our hour uh, but I, i'll hand over to you for, for kind of consolidation of thoughts there i think just uh, that last point as well i suppose it, it sounds unbelievably narcissistic and like whatever uh, I suppose, a luxury to sort of speak this way, but I suppose what we want to do is raise a bigger question that's about creatives uh, in Scotland and how, I suppose one of the things that has occurred to me is how people like Janice and Women's Library Women and other incredible uh, innovations that have happened, led by lots of, of people in Scotland, that there's a sort of like equivalence that looking at the landscape, I mean, there's actually somebody sitting in the audience who created this incredible, absolutely brilliant, inspirational thing for the Women's Library that was around empowering women in lots of different fields of music and uh, performance and so on and so forth. And so many of these things are done, invested in as volunteers, but actually the way that it appears in this sort of landscape of cultural production is that there's no acknowledging that some organisations have had paid workers and have been regularly funded from the get-go and other organisations haven't and we're talking about this in this fantastic milestone meeting with Jude and Susanna and Nicola and Susanna remember coming up with this sort of concept that I thought oh that's it she just went like arms houses for creatives and we went, precisely Precisely, you know, we don't want to own this house. We just want to be safe, like warm, uh, have a little dancing, jigging space, um, you know, and, but actually have some sort of like acknowledgement that there are people who decided that they're gonna do something because it wasn't being done in the mainstream and because there was a deficit in the actual provision, do you know what I mean? Like, so it's not about saying, so, oh, let's have another exhibition space, because there's plenty of exhibition space, but I like being a curator. This is about saying, loads of people aren't seeing themselves represented in the financed mainstream cultural uh, offer. So we feel we have to do that because people need to be represented. It can't just be pale male style people running and being represented in the art. So, so you set something up, but there's no resourcing for that. And then when it is resourced, there's an apparent alignment there for people who have 
invested in organisations and built up that uh, array of different ways that Scotland represents itself in the world. So um, I think that's something that I feel like is a wider political issue. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know whether there could be radical arms houses. I'm open to that idea. Uh, I think it's lovely. I've been photographing a lot of arms houses the last wee while, and yeah, short of being a female vicar, um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe that's the only only way that we're going to do it. But that would be weird. Um, we want to sort of pivot now to, to be a bit more. You know, you've been incredibly, incredibly indulgent in hearing us, but we were talking about this that we've been not like, holding this in for a long, long time. I was just yes. Archifringe, we're here, we can sort of share all this. So, sorry for like, the, bis the, the, the loads of stuff, but actually this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the doors are locked. Um, so, but what we thought we'd do to sort of like pivot a little bit to, to enable people to uh, help us reach our goal um, is we wanted to sort of think about this in terms of the way that we've been working. So I've been involved in Women's Library, I've been involved in these different housing projects, I've been involved in lots of different campaigning groups over the year. Sue the same, Jonas has been doing loads and loads of stuff developing. Another critical resource that was missing in the cultural landscape. And I think we should sort of teach each other over the last few while to sort of remember that this isn't a project that is for other people other than at the next remove. Do you know what I mean? That we are not, that we're sort of feeling like it's really important that we do this for ourselves because time is finite and we've got to do this. So we're really, really interested in concrete, solution-focused activities and, and offers of support that others can help us achieve this thing. And we've been thinking about the questions that are going to fuel any uh, innovative endeavour. It's always like question generated, isn't it? So sort of distilling these questions. So the why now and the what do we want are very much the questions that we are going to be almost like uh, looking at, exploring and developing over the next weeks and months. But certainly now we're in Archifringe, getting the luxury of time to do that. But we have some questions here, like who can make it happen? What do we need to know? And what else is happening? That we thought a lot of you might be able to uh, help us answer. Um, and we wanted to sort of ask you, I mean, I don't know, are there people who are involved in architecture and design in the room? Lovely, fantastic. Um, any people who are involved in uh, areas like, well, politics? Oh, interesting. Okay, well, we're going to seek them out yeah. and we're going to invite them into the space. We've already started that process, so we're going to be inviting lots of people into the space. Anybody involved in social care or in economies, like we're really interested in feminist economies and so on and so forth? Lovely, great stuff, great stuff. So we would really like, as we've been talking, we've been logging further questions that have really arisen for us, just in this type of dialogue, and we'd love people to be able to concretely respond to some of these questions. And I suppose we owe it to ourselves really to sort of say, we're trying to resist solving immediately other people's housing needs. And it's actually in our DNA almost to sort of think, oh, we should be thinking about everybody else's housing needs. Do you know what? We're, we're, just, we, uh, we're not going to live forever, and we really need to focus on solving this thing for us and hopefully be sharing as we go along. So, for example, we're sharing our process, we're doing this publicly, we're sharing information, and hopefully providing some sort of inspiration and we're acknowledging at the same time that we're not the only people doing this so um, we would be really keen to sort of um, log 
appreciate, honour people who are solving the problem and seeing ourselves in this constellation, as Sue said, to start, to start off with, of local and local solution-focused activities that are part of this pattern of seismic change that we think is required in care, in architecture, in social housing, and so on and so forth. So, I, I was so just going to, uh, we'll repeat this uh, kind of towards the end as well, but just in case um, people want to like percolate some of this or you go away thinking about it and, uh, and, and or you don't kind of speak today and the rest of the time that we've got for some other reason. Uh, the three of us will be here for the rest of the week. We're here until uh, a week tomorrow, I think, until the, the, the final, the, the middle Sunday. Uh, and we're here kind of in residence, you know, so we'll be working, we'll be doing kind of active research. So come and meet with us and talk to us uh, and bring, you know, anything that you can offer to the table uh, as well. We'll also be making a, a podcast from uh, tomorrow. We'll be going uh, live uh, not live, recorded, but out there. Uh, and we, we, we've got a Twitter handle, which is at roof raising. Now, we won't be replying to everybody. We won't, you know, we'll, we'll be tweeting and we'll be keeping people up to date. Uh, so, again, if you've got anything to offer or comment on, please do. And we'll, it might very well be that we pick up on that. But it's at roof raising. Um, and we, what we'll do is we'll post on our Twitter the link to the podcast. Um, just looking at Amanda, our podcaster. Uh, but we'll, 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 th those will be daily uh, recordings that, that will be going out as we reflect on each day of, uh, of thoughts and action here uh, in this space. Uh, and also on the screen here, there's a set of earphones where those the, the podcast will be uh, the daily podcast will be playing there. So I just wanted to mention that just in case anybody kind of doesn't stay for the rest of the afternoon. I know there's a lot of other things on as well. It's an, a really great program. But just in case. You know anybody? Do, we do lose anybody. Then, then just do keep do keep in touch with us. I think Jonas is going to sort of give you give us an idea of the how we're going to use the space now and how we're going to use the space next week or the rest of the occupant. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of over to you now. Um, we're going to use. Are we are we in good time? Perfect. Perfect. Great. Perfect. So we're going to use the next bit of perfect time, about 14 minutes. Um, I think the first thing that we'll set up is we're going to we're going to ask you just to speak to your neighbour, and and because I'm sure I, I any time I've ever spoken about what we're thinking and what our desires are and what I feel I need, and there's so much comes back. So I really feel it's it's something that's in the air and people want to and need to talk about it. I mean, the demographic is massive in this country in terms of the shift in who's going to be older and who's going to be younger. Um, so I think maybe take the first five, um, five, ten minutes-ish just to talk to whoever's around you, what's come up for you today. And then we're going to, we'll, we'll interject into that and then we're going to invite you to come and also write any, um, anything that you think would be concrete and helpful for us, which is then something that we, will, we can share on as, as we distill that and work with that. So, um, invitation to come and look at the questions. I've done a really, a really messy one there, but, um, um, and write um, anything you think would be useful and also have a chat with us, and then we're gonna pull it all together at the end. So that's kind of our next hour. So. Just say hello to your neighbour. Introduce yourself, say hi, and, and you begin to share. So before the afternoon is out, please somebody, can you concretely and in a solution focused way, tell me the answer to the question in the positive, can we have our own windmill? Um, <laughs> I'd like oh, four or five. Answers, answers. This is what we can have your own I conjured this woman up out of my imagination. <laughs> she's here, she's 
she's one of the world's <laughs> most renowned architects. She's ready for action. So, brilliant. So, just remember those questions and then we're just going to come and, and meet with you. But onwards. Go, so, thank you. We've got three beautiful desks which are going to sit about there, which we've got markings on the floor and we've got them placed, we think, at a beautiful job to angle. <laughs> um, but there's also an invitation for people when they walk round um, and into the space. So we will be here at these desks. We'll, we'll also have a large table which sits at another beautiful jaunty angle which is lined up with this one. Um, that's going to sit between these two pillars. Um, so we're going to go from our own notebooks. So some of this will, um, material will go into these notebooks. We'll start to research. We'll start to find what really resonates and, and, and is relevant for us. Um, and we'll go from our private notebooks into some messy writing over there. Like this is, I call this beautiful, but I mean, mine is really messy. And then from that point, we're going to distill it into um, kind of research books. So inside each of them will be sheets of paper that we will neatly write. <laughs> and these are the things that will be left. These are the traces that will be left once we leave the space that are there for people to leaf through and look at and, um, and yeah, just Yes, get, take anything from them that would be helpful for you in, in, in your journey, in that sense. There'll be our thoughts and processes in there as well. Then at four o'clock every day, we're going to sit around our tables and we're going to um, distill even further from what's uh, written there, which will then be written there into a daily podcast. And that podcast we will share, it will also come up on our um, TV slideshow here, but it will also be available online. I'm just going to say magically, because that's magic for me. SoundCloud and through our um, Twitter. We'll share the link. We'll share the link. We'll share the link. So again, we're trying to make as much um, of the information available as possible. We are also hopeful that the film that Tara is taking here will be able to make that publicly available as well. That's what we're, we're hoping. So we do want to share as much as possible. And also, uh, we have, with the knowledge that we have had about what do we need to know, um, we've made contact with different people, like somebody that we know um, through uh, being involved in Glasgow Women's Library from Regeneration Agency, uh, somebody we know that runs a housing association, different people that we thought could help us answer some of these questions and actually give us concrete, uh, solution-focused feedback. We're inviting them to discussions uh, each day. So some of the people that you've mentioned, we're going to be very gallus and completely bold and brave and invite them along to discussions that are going to be taking place in Archifrage which you can come and listen to, you can come and initiate discussions with us. But I think the, the thing that we're trying to think about is like by invitation. So we're trying really, really hard to sort of stay in the driving seat. And as I say, like almost like unlearn a lot of the things that we're thinking about, about saying, no, please, it's about you and your house. No, actually, we're trying to keep focused on getting to the goal. And hopefully the, what we'll be modelling will be helpful to and inspire others. So we are going to be having those discussions over the next wee while. So if you think that there's somebody that we need to speak to urgently, some of the suggestions that have come through already are like phenomenally important in the next stages. So we'll be acting on 
all the bits of information that have been so kindly and generously shared already sort of like it, it, almost like how it's going to fit into the overall purpose so um thank you very much but are there other things that we're going to be up to you two covered us. So come and see and read and send us. Oh yes, there is one other thing as well. Janice has sourced this gorgeous box over there. And um, we've all already had some really incredible thoughts <laughs> called tweetings <laughs> of things that are sent to us. And we're, it's almost like a little post box for things like I was going to say cash. No, not cash. Um, actually... <laughs> Ultimately, <laughs> cash, but maybe more um, professionally, it would be like business cards that lead to, ultimately to cash, or um, articles, or websites, or uh, inspiring people. So there's another way of almost like posting things in there. Particularly when we're not here, so that can also, obviously when we're here, we're here to speak to, and when we're not here, we want to keep that an active process. Thank you ever so much for rocking up. We were worried about maybe one person turning up and then earlier in the week we were worried about 100 people turning up. So it's like the perfect, perfect <laughs> array of wonderful people. And thank you. And thanks again to Archie Fringe as well. Thank you.